Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is a bonus episode um, that we're doing because this month on 3%, we're covering New York Review of Books all month, mostly through Anniversaries by Uwe Janssen. Um, but I wanted to talk to a few people from NYRB about editorial things, marketing things, so on and so forth. So this week, we're proud to have Nick During on from New York Review of Books, a marketing extraordinaire. Publicist. Publicist, Publicist. extraordinaire. And uh, we're also joined um, by Anthony Blake, who's the marketing publicity director at Open Letter. Hey, Hello. <laughs> Hi. So how long have you been at NYRB, Nick? Eight years. I thought, I thought it's been a while. How, yeah, how, did, you get, how did you get into, uh, into NYRB and into doing publicity? Um, well, I had seen the books and liked the books. And I had a job in sales at Workman Publishing, oh, right. as far away as possible from the stuff that we do as one can imagine. Um, and I had actually tried to get a job at NYAB years ago and ended up getting a beer with Edwin, but there were no jobs. And then I did see a job open on, I don't know, Publishers Marketplace or whatever one of those boards were, and applied and wrote to Edwin and got interviewed by my boss, Linda Hollick. And got the job. That was the marketing job. Right. And then the publicist left and I became the publicist. Very cool. And and how do you like being the publicist? It's pretty good. <laughs> Most of our authors are dead, so it changes the thing. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many yeah, how many live off author, authors do you end up working with? Well, we do this not just in the NYAB Classic series, but we have this New York Review book series where we often, it used to be like essays, collections from the New York Review of Books magazine. And it still kind of is. We have a Daniel Mendelssohn collection oh, right. coming up, not just from New York Review of Books, but, you know, a lot of them. And then, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we changed to, to less essay collections from the New York Review, more original books. So we did... We did um, Eric Carpellis's Almost Nothing biography of Joseph Chapsky, which we also published Joseph Chapsky books. And, and, and we basically do, and we did a Mitch Hurry's. We did the first novel recently, a Mitch Hurry's Friend of My Youth, yeah. and that in English. So we're now, that series, which is roughly six books a year, tend to be living authors. We have a Tim Parks book coming up. Oh, what's that one? Out of My Head about consciousness and reality. Really? Did you ever read his pod, his, for the New York Review Daily, he did these like dialogues with this Italian neuroscience guy called Riccardo Manzotti. Did you ever see these? No. I'll have to go find those because I like him quite a bit. He's a good writer. Controversial it's, it's writer. Book. It's what? Controversial writer. Controversial. This is, con this is probably slightly controversial because here is Tim Park's translator, novelist, book reviewer writing a book about, you know, reality and philosophy and neuroscience. <laughs> Seems a little bit out of it, but why not? It's actually pretty fun. And he's a good writer. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we do more in that series. In the classic series, every now and again. Right. Mostly, and we don't really do translation ones. I mean, the most famous one, we did Renata Adler a mm -hmm. couple of years ago when we brought her on tour. Right now, we have Darius James's book, Negrophobia, but these are American, you know, tend to be American reissues. Right, right. So, so dealing, and that's, that's one of the things that I thought it would be interesting to talk to you about is like the different strategies for reissues versus original translations versus retranslations and what kind of obstacles you see. Yeah. But maybe the best way to start talking about everything is through this anniversaries yeah. book, which is wild. So, are you liking it? Uh, yeah, I'm only like 150 pages in, maybe. Um, a long way to go, mate. And the, uh, yeah, you don't say. This is 10%. a big ass book. I don't even think that's 10. percent <laughs> I think it's less than 10. percent Less than 10 by a lot. Which is <laughs> I haven't finished it. Yeah, I mean, how many people do you think have? How did? Okay, so that's a that's a question. Like, if you're if you're as a publicist, what? Yeah. Like, one of the things you probably want to have happen is some some tastemakers to read the book. And to talk about how great it yeah. is to read the book, how are you trying which is to? Which not a lot. Which is <laughs> not going to be a lot. <laughs> like, what, what, yeah, how did you I, approach that? I don't know. I mean, this one was pretty hard because the book was so long, and the production of it was so expensive. You know, I mean, this one, this is like different from what we normally do because right from the beginning, everyone was like, 
we need to sell lots of this book. You know, we can't just publish this and sell 2,000 copies. It needs to be bigger. Um, one of the decisions which was to, this is where I'm talking about publishing rather than publicity, yep. but like whether to do it, because originally in German, it's four, it's four books and yep. it came out in four times. And actually the German, one of the, you know, I think it must be so kind of Verlag or whatever, mm -hmm. has the four editions in a box set. And I was like, we should sell, we should sell them individually. And, you know, so that they're all manageable. I mean, this will be long books. Yeah. But we, we got freaked out because, yes, you probably sell some of the first one, but then you find that nobody's going to buy volumes three and four, and that would be, I don't know, not good, I guess. So we decided to force people to buy the whole thing by doing it all together. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a weird gambit. So, like, I, I mean, I guess it's, the situation is different for the card because the books are being... Oh, they're contemporary, I guess. They're so. contemporary, but, like, when... They did when Archipelago or, and and Random House UK did volume one, volume six wasn't finished yet? Yeah. Right. So there's no possible yeah, yeah. Yeah. that you could do it all as one thing. But it, do, do you have any inside information on like if the sales did dip for them from book one onwards? I don't know. I would assume yes, but Me I too. don't know. But I don't know I mean, either. Sometimes, sometimes with these ones, I would assume – now Scott and Ferrante, the buzz happens not necessarily in book one, but in book two or three, and then everybody gets super hyped for, you know, the rest of them. But because those are coming, I mean, even if it's, have we, have we lost Chad? No, I'm still here. There you go. Um, I can't see you anymore, but that's fine. Oh. Um, I assume, you know, for this one, which is not like new books, like even if they've already been written in their original language, at least for the English, because, you know, you can't get the Ferrante books or the Canals Guide until the translation comes out. The anniversary is actually, there is another translation of it, yeah. um, which is cut quite a lot um, from the, I think, no, it must be in the 80s, published, the famous Drinker Willen is the editor of it, who knew Uwe Janssen and Trenka's old boss, Helen Wolf, was like mates with him yeah. and brought him out. And in fact, the, you know, the, his time in New York in 1968 is working at Houghton Mifflin because Helen Wolf has gotten him this job and Trenka is Helen Wolf's, you know, kind of protege. Mm -hmm. um, all this to say that they did a translation. So you could in fact read Anniversary's cut in that old translation. So I actually, at the time, I must admit, I argued forcing people to spend 40 bucks, forcing people to read this huge fucking thing at once is a disaster. No one's going to do it. And everyone was, and Linda were like, too bad. We have to do it all at once. We have to force people to buy the whole thing. Wow. And I think they might be right. I actually don't know. Maybe they weren't. Who knows? <laughs> 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 what, yeah, what else did you guys try with the, like from you from a publicity standpoint you don't have the author author's dead it's yeah. translation it's huge there is this other existent Very value pressure. yeah yeah and you had a lot of pressure to sell it what did, did you have any particular things in mind that you that you we, tried to implement we did a lot i mean we did the i don't know if you saw all this stuff i probably sent them to you yeah we did what we called an end of summer um kind of pamphlet yep that was just damien did an introduction and it was the first, I don't know, 30 pages. Yeah. And we kind of called it the end of summer. It was really just, I think we did start on day number one, but casino at beach and it was kind of meant to be, we did it at summer and it was probably two years before the book came out. Yeah. Um, there also was a little bit of time pressure because the book takes place 1968, 1967 through 1968. So the idea was that we would get it out for a 50th anniversary, which we failed to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're close and enough, then, though. And then, yeah, and then we, I mean, then we, I mean, we did that end of summer thing two years before the book come out and came out, and normally we don't even, I don't even know what books are coming out two years from now. Wow. And we then did galleys of the first quarter, the first book, the quite summer. a lot. We handed that out at Winter Institute. The That's what you have, I think. I have, I have two, That's I think... For whatever reason, I have two of the volumes, but not all of the galleys. You sent me like okay. half of them. And yeah. I have the book, yeah, yeah, the finished copy. We did a lot of the first quarter in galley. 
and we sent that to Winter Institute and begged people to read it. We then did galleys of one and two, as, and then we did galleys of what it ended up being, as we call them, you know, book one, book two, right. which is really books one, two, and three, four. Right. And, and then, <laughs> and so we had to send out those galleys, and then we had to send out the final book. Jesus, just yeah. the printing cost and the shipping of this alone yeah. seems and like and the box set and the box set. So I have a I have a I have a related story that's uh, from Anthony because he's reading um, one of World World Editions World Editions mm. books. Um, oh yeah, the Devil one. The what de- is it? It's uh, the de- a Devil comes to town. I think is the. How yeah, a devil comes to town. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. How big uh, is it? Who's, who's the author? Uh, Paolo Marinzig. Okay. An Italian guy. Okay. Uh, but it's it's super wild. So I'll, I'll try to briefly okay. give the gist of it. But but it's like one of the most insane setups of a book. Um, so there's a host of rabid foxes in the woods of this town. In the town, everyone's a writer. They all secretly like have a manuscript hidden in their closet or wherever, but none of them are famous. So it's all okay. There's no like weird competing egos. They're all just writing. Um, The devil finds out about this and he's like, well, these are the most narcissistic people in the world. I'm going to go to this town. And so he comes to the town as a famous publisher and starts to like unsettle the whole world. And there's these foxes that are like encroaching on the city and it's told in like these nested narratives, kind of like a, um, like a Frankenstein or something like that, where there's letters. Someone's found the manuscript of the priest in the town, who also that's being dictated through another person. So it's absolutely wild. I don't know why Chad's bringing it up, but that's, I do. That's... I, okay, so they did. They send out the galleys, and numbers are what numbers are on everything, especially in publishing. But on the back, they say how many copies of the galley they're printing. Guess how many oh, they yeah, say yeah. they're printing. A thousand? Fourteen hundred. Hmm. What publisher is this? World Editions? Yeah. They said they're doing a print run of 30,000. That's a lot. There's no way. <laughs> it seems like a niche. Like, I'm I'm hyper interested in this book. I'm most of the way through it. But it seems like a niche kind of interest. Yeah. I don't know. I said, like, 1,400 galleys is more than some of our books sell. Yeah. We printed 10,000 of anniversaries in the box set. Oh, the, the finished book? The, the finished, finished thing, thing. Yeah. Which yeah, a lot. It's a lot, and it's definitely, like one of like a world renowned like... author. Yeah, yeah, and a famous book. How? So that's a, that's another question that I was looking to write about um, some of like your rediscovery projects, and one that that I'm really interested in because I was involved in it when it was when he was rediscovered at Dulkey is um, Henry Green, and so like yeah. you guys when you do those those ones, you seem to have like the idea of like re somehow reinventing this author so that new audiences will find them and will be in, interested in them. Um, how does that, how, like, what are your kind of like beliefs or strategies for that and making that happen? I know Green is a particularly weird one in a way because he keeps getting rediscovered. Right. He was rediscovered every 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is. Or, or, or 10. Like, yeah, it's or like 10 as, yeah. as, as, we, as we head towards like the spiral death of the universe, it's just more and more frequent Henry Green about rediscoveries. About yeah, we forget all over again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, the green Edwin, to distinguish it, gave them original covers. And the art is you know, normally they license art from originally existing art and you get the rights to it and put them on the cover. But this one, to make that different, he he got original art for it. And they did them in yeah. three sets, three different seasons. And he, I mean, I guess he tried to make, he, he was making a claim. We didn't do them chronologically. No. We did, um, I think we did Loving Court and Back first. And those are the World War Two ones. And Edwin's claim is that Henry Green is best as a writer writing about the Second World War. He's not really, even though Loving is kind of famous for, you know, being a kind of upstairs, downstairs mm-hmm. Irish manor house Really, it's about the Second World War. Court, definitely about the Second World War. Back, about you know trauma coming back from the Second World War. And these are the best of the books. So we did them, he kind of, by putting those first, and they probably are the best, but was also trying to make a claim. And we got the new covers. And we did things like we don't normally do. Like, with the reissues, we often just, um, you know, Sarah, they, they scan the existing 
text and we print it. And in this one, they re they retypeset it and um, have to copy it so that one gives it the original design. So that's just another way to make it stand out as a new thing. But Henry Green is a bit different. I mean, it worked for me because I had heard of Henry Green mm -hmm. but never actually read him. So, you know, it's the kind of a, a nice thing where you like, oh, I know that author's meant to be good, but I've never read it. Here's my chance. I mean, I'm the publicist. I'm supposed to, but sometimes <laughs> you can get that kind of lucky break that, you know, you know people have heard the name and probably never read it, and now we can kind of say, you know the name. <laughs> are there books that I wanted to ask Edwin this from like a uh, editorial perspective, but for you, are there books that are like the books that you're going to be marketing to classrooms to be taught and sold for a long time versus the books that you think have a longer, like a stronger trade existence? Or do you just treat them equally in both cases? I, I think my general answer would be equally. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sometimes we definitely make an extra effort. I mean, it seems so hard to convince people, you know, classroom adoptions. It'd be great when it happens, but it's so hard to do. It's just, the, you know, the academic world is so big and diffuse, and how are you going to, you know, I mean, I know Penguin Random House has, they go to, you know, even if you go, if you go to MLA, I mean, if you go and put books on display at MLA, does that mean all of a sudden you're going to get course adoptions? No. No. Um, but, I mean, the general point, is you know for us and for us and no doubt you know for you the idea is you put a bit of effort you put effort in at the to launch the book and then hopefully people will read the book forever is the idea you know <laughs> yeah. they should never go out of date and you know i think big trade presses you know the books go on sale they go in stores they like sell lots then they know the book is going to get taken off the shelves and sent back. And that's, you know, you can find the library on Amazon, but you won't be able to see it. And we would hope that you can always find our books and worth reading forever. Right. Which means like your backlist is like a huge part of your, of your profile and of the, the, both, I hope probably financially for like the, the cash flow of, of NYRB that the backlist continues to sell and continues to bring in revenue after you've already launched it. And there's their books that are like, yeah. people are continually going back to like Stoner or like Month in the Country even yeah. that are like much older that you guys are selling year in and year out. Yeah. Um, that Which is the same for every publisher, that. isn't it? What's that? The same for every publisher. Yeah, except I don't know the big ones, like if they have a hit, yes. But if they don't have a hit, they can just dump it. And you guys yeah. don't necessarily dump it. But with that, do you do, are there things that you try and do to like get those re those re rediscovered? So that's been out. Stoner's been out for a long time. Yeah. It's still selling. But it, do you ever think like, oh, you know, maybe I can get all the bookstores in this place to redo something for Stoner this month? No. Yes and no. I guess. I mean, partially because of labor. I mean, yeah. you know. I am a publicist and my job is to get out the word about the books that are coming out. That's our job, yeah. my job. And it's pretty, you know, there are occasional, sometimes, you know, sometimes there are movies, you know, Stefan Zweig, there was that Wes Anderson movie and there was a bit of oh, thing, yeah. but that was just luck. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we don't, we talk more. We talk more than do the kind of time get people at the backlist again. You know, it's like writing a grant. <laughs> it's, and I, I mean, honest. And also, I guess, I mean, for my personal taste, it's more. It's more fun. You know, the fun part of my job is reading, and I discover books at the same time, as hopefully other people, as I might be able to get other people to discover them. Going backwards for me is not quite as much fun even if financially it makes more sense for the company. <laughs> you know, okay, you know, fair, fair, fair. When I, I read Sona, it was the first book when I, when I got the job. I oh, was really? Like, I was, in 2011, I was like, I better read one of these books. I'll read Stoner. But I don't really feel the need to read it again, personally. Yeah, okay. But I'm excited to read the new books. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Who's who's the most important, or what group of of tastemakers or people or outlets are is most important? Do you think for these sorts of books that you guys are doing? Is it like New York Times book reviews, or is it independent booksellers? Is it? I just did a class. I'll frame this a little bit more. Yeah. I just did my taught my class at. Um, I took them to Barnes and Noble uh, campus, Barnes and Noble essentially, 
and made them walk around and pick out the books that they would buy if they could just buy yeah. whatever books and right. ask them like why they buy it, why were they attracted to those ones and yeah. like trying to and like figure out what made them pick those up and it was one that they're on display and they noticed the cover and they liked the cover and then far distant was like they'd heard the name of the book and they saw it and were like oh yeah someone's mentioned that to me I should I should grab this one yeah. um, but it was like the display was like the most crucial element to it was it on sale was another one like they're the 20 percent off stickers so like for their like world like all the things that we sort of like are like being involved in like book twitter or whatever is so far removed from like this yeah. average like college student going yeah. into a bookstore wasn't that it was like yeah this cover look it has a dragon on it like that's yeah. cool that was yeah. like... <laughs> so i was curious like what you what things are most important for you guys getting the word out to your perceived audience i don't know i mean I think publicity is pretty important, you know, I mean, because I think that, you know, the brand or for word that it is, is important and the cover design is the best way of creating that brand. And that, so people like NYAB Classics and like the brand and will go into the store and see a bunch of them, but the one that they're going to buy out of that thing, out of the, out of the whole group, maybe they've heard of the author. Well, probably because they've heard of it and maybe that's because it's famous. I mean, Henry Green is not famous, famous, but if you're pretty, yeah. you know, my mom loves Henry Green, right? So right. I knew about Henry Green and my mom was like, Henry Green is really good. Right. So like, but otherwise if it's, if it's kind of someone like that, who maybe you have heard of, and have never read but are just a bit or it's publicity that you've seen reviews about and you're like oh of all these books i like nyb classics here's a shelf of 10 of them which one i'm, I'm gonna i've decided to buy one which one i'm gonna buy it's gonna be the one that has gotten some attention but yeah i mean i think the, we're pretty reliant on the brand i mean edwin says the brand sells itself <laughs> What I think, you know, when he's like struggling, you know, when we're trying to pitch the reps and they're like saying, why would anybody care about this book? <laughs> Edward's basically saying, because we're publishing it. <laughs> <laughs> we should try that next time. See what he says. How does, yeah, how, yeah, how is it like pitching to your sales reps? <laughs> what was that? How is it pitching to your sales reps? Uh, we did it yesterday. Ooh. Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, our books, none of, you know, none of them are like obvious, huge hits. None of them are going to be like, everybody's asking about the next Lady Smith. Here's the next Lady Smith book, you know, go mm. sell. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have all been talking about um, Sally Rooney. We've got another Sally Rooney book, go sell, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes things happen. Renata Adler was obviously a case where people, yeah. you know, kind of picked up right away. Eve Babbitts has recently been one. That, yeah, that like, seems like that'd be I mean, huge. You know, in terms of talking about translation, it's hard to get the, tra you know, the ones that we're talking, the ones that come to mind, the ones that I mentioned are people I've heard of, Henry Green, Renata Adler, Eve Babbitts. I mean, you know, right. they're, all, they're all English. Well, it's English language. Um, I don't know. The only one... The translation, the one that got buzzed for us was Zama people have clearly heard of. Yeah. That one yeah. that, you know, right off the bat, people were like, oh, yeah, the Benedetto. Yeah. The film has probably helped too, maybe, or no? And the film, although we published the book before the movie came. I mean, it was in the air, and Lucretia Martel mm -hmm. is a big deal. And so I think people do, you know, follow her kind of work. And, and I think she spent a long time and I know she spent a long time making that movie. So I think it was because she took her so much longer than her other movies. I mean, we've seen her other movies. They're all like family dark dramas. Well, this one was, you know, weird squash, squash, kind of stuff. <laughs> I still haven't seen the movie. I taught the book yeah. in my class though. And the students, a lot of them really, really loved it. Yeah. It's a weird book and a weird movie. It's definitely a weird book. Yeah. The movie's weird too. Awesome. Watch it. I it's will. Good. It's very good. If it's if it's on the Netflix or somewhere that can get it. You know, they, it didn't it didn't come to the like, the local Rochester theater for some reason. Nah, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah, it really um, is. I was going to ask you to play a game of like 
if you could give on a scale of one to 10, what the importance is for translated books in particular, your books in specific to, to get a largest, as large of audience as possible. Like I can name a thing and you can tell me like on a scale of one to 10, 10 being it's the most important, yeah. um, one being it's really not that important. None of, none of this is to disparage any of these tastemakers or, or opportunities. It's just curious to see like, what are, what is most important to us? So New York Times, front page New York Times review. It's never happened. I know, but you're guessing. But I would assume it's pretty important. Let's say eight. Eight? Okay. Yeah. A- attending Book Expo. Mm, two. <laughs> <laughs> Winter Institute. Five. Man Booker Prize. Probably ten. <laughs> Best Translated Book Award Prize. <laughs> Eleven. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Answer. I would, I would say four, um, <laughs> four to six. Thanks. National Book Award in translation. Mm. I saw them PW. The barber was saying that that book is really sold. So Did let's say seven. So um, I would have, if before reading that article and where the barber is telling the truth about it, I assume she is. We can look up the numbers, I guess. And the numbers um, and the article don't add up. Okay, well, there you go. uh, Without looking at the numbers and seeing the article, without reading the article, I would have said like six, five, five or six. Reading the article, I would say seven, and I haven't looked at the numbers, but I trust you. Uh, They, uh, uh, um, yeah, Tom didn't want me to talk about it on our podcast that went live this morning. Um, (laughs) Because like, once you you, you scratch the surface, you're like, oh, that sounds really good. And then you're like, scratch the surface, you're like, wait a second, like, this doesn't quite make sense, but like the impact was much, even, even within the context of the numbers on there, if you take them at face value was like saying that it was like 250 more copies sold for about a month. Yeah. Although I still would, you know, back to the launching. I mean, none of these authors are super famous, you know, even if new directions and other publishers have been doing them for a long time and that kind of, I do think it accumulates. And I wonder whether over the years, you know, that book will, be a regular New Directions backlist right. hit that they could go back to, and that it, you know, rather than if it didn't win, and it might end up being, not you know, gone in a minute. Yeah, so there's like that that idea too with the, the presses that we're talking about of like that long, the like you say the the cumulative effect over a period of time where like things had to get through the bottleneck. Like if they yeah. if they sell, you could sell a lot at the beginning, but then if it all drops off and everything's returned and like nothing happens, those books sort of die out. And then there's the others yeah. that like start out slowly and at some point spike and just keep and going keep, yeah, and yeah. keep going. Like, yeah, like we had that with like physics of sorrow for us by Gorgi Gospodinov. Yeah. I don't even think there's like a specific thing that happened, but it did okay when it came out and then just something clicked and now it sells like hundreds of copies every year and it's been reprinted yeah. like three times and it's like yeah. no clear reason. But then there's well, another I, book that I'm, that didn't happen to. I, I believe that, you know, this is a bit of an optimistic take, but that, you know, if the books are good and appealing to a certain ish, to a certain, you know, segment of the reading population, then they will hopefully get to the audience over a long period. I mean, lots of, as you know, as we all know, we do publish good books and nobody cares and it's not because they're not good. Right. But I do think the ones that work probably because there's something about their quality. I mean, you know, publicity and marketing is this crapshoot and nobody really knows. I mean, <laughs> you, don't do, you don't guys don't have focus groups. No, we never do focus groups. Do you? No, of course not. I'm just joking. Like there's do you, you use your classes to, as focus groups. No. Oh God, that would, I'm going to just, I'm going to plead the fifth. Okay. I think it's better not to respond to that, that statement. <laughs> they read some um, of our books they and they we talk about other things i i mind them for information on where they find out about stuff from yeah like what are, what are the fine. kids listening to or today yeah the, yeah what about going back to the numbers what about like mla um three i'd say the same rep nights at an independent bookstore rep nights um I don't know, five? Oh, I was going to go higher than that. I would say yeah, seven. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because I feel like those people get really excited and like... Yeah, you can turn them on. And I, if somebody I, there is already turned on about a book, they can turn themselves on. 
Yeah. And here's the one. I meant to be explicit, but. Here's the legit 11 is uh, independent bookstore that carries every one of your titles in like a group section. Yeah. Like Unabridged does. Yeah. That's where your brand selling itself is like. That's where the brand is really. I mean, we had a New York Times article last year about our books on, on Instagram. <laughs> really? I, wait, I don't yeah. think I saw that one. The, the journalist was like wanting to do a did an article about NYB classes on Instagram. It was amazing. We had to give them, we had to, had, we wanted to talk to Edwin. We had to like tell Edwin what Instagram was. I <laughs> 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 have him interview this person, get interviewed. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Even I know what Instagram is. Yeah, I know what Instagram is. Do you, do you, you must do Instagram. I have, I have an account on Instagram. I don't use that account, the, but Open Letter has one that Anthony yeah. runs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're slowly building. It, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not our most developed account, but we're on, we're on the yeah. way. It's how, yeah. How do you? What do you think of those? Of the social media platforms, which are most important to you? I don't know. I mean, we do really well on them, and people like pictures. <laughs> More than words, for sure. Well, yeah, they like the pictures get do well, but it's hard to tell whether they. I think they probably do sell some books. You know, and I do think it is all cumulative and that, you know, the more you throw something in front of people, you know, the subcon, you know, so we don't do any like scientific stuff, but I do, you know, this is like age old, you know, marketing kind of law subconsciously, maybe people start to like, maybe they take out their wallet at one point. I don't know. Changes their willingness to buy. Yeah. What about libraries? How do you deal with libraries? Oof. I uh, uh, hope that consortium does something for the libraries. We do have a list. We have gone to ALA. Oh yeah, what are you? Have you been to? A You've been to ALA. We used to go all the time. Me too. We take off, now, but I think we're going this year. Where is it this year? I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I'm going, but I think I'm just going. Yeah. Um, I mean, we also combined. Yeah, because we actually did ALA together in Vegas. Right. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Now that I think about it, the uh -huh. um those those the ALA convention itself, I don't ever feel is super valuable. But the the contacts, we do contact our yeah. librarian people a lot, and they seem to respond yeah. rather regularly. Yeah, I mean, we're also combining. I guess more for MLA, we do combine the books and the magazine side. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and probably MLA is the most obvious one where I do think good for the magazine to have a presence in it. Yeah, and that's um, it seems like that's a place too where a lot of people come and recommend books to reissue. Yeah. Which is a question like I put up all those stats for the last uh post about you guys and um you it seems like you have been doing more original translations lately compared to earlier. Is that like something that is intentional or coincidence or it's, something I, you did or intentional since when I started in 2011 Edwin was very keen that that I mean, and I think we will, you know, always fight to be, you know, he doesn't want it just to be thought of as a reissue series. Yeah. And, you know, we put NYB Classics Original, you probably see it on the website, it says NYB Classics Original, and we put on the copy, the, the feed that goes out yeah. to Amazon and whatnot. And that's meant to be a marker of this is a new translation uh, or a new collection of short stories or essays, even if they're, you know, um, it's hard to get across because why, you know, in anyone world's, care but edwin cares about it and so we we do and you know i mean to i guess when there is a reissue of a book not by renata adler or mm -hmm. Ian babbitts but say i don't know <laughs> i don't know but yeah. like you know then there's some but there is a translator who is active and keen and excited then it will put the fire under my belly to do more, you know, because a lot of the job, as you know, is we do it because we want people we work with to feel good about themselves. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's real money. Um, and, you know, the translator wants this to happen. You have to make it happen, not because you necessarily think it's going to become a New York Times bestseller list or they want to do an event, so you do the event, not because you think tons of people are going to show up, but because... The translator wants it, and you want to make them happy. And artist care, author care, translator care. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so, 
we've Which seen is, it. I think it's a bit is a bit unfair because that means say you have a translator who lives in New York, where you have to see you have a translator who lives in Asia who's like so far away. Then do you put more time into the translator who lives in not near you? Yes, probably. Yeah. 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 That's all like, yeah, definitely. The, um, related to that, like we have a lot of the, the authors that are overseas tend to still have like a, what seems now antiquated view of how the books are received and talked about in the U S press. And like, right. there should be reviews in newspapers. Yeah. Like when are the newspapers yeah. going to be reviewing this? When are the yeah. magazines reviewing yeah. it? Why hasn't there been like a, a launch review on the date that it comes out? That yeah. sort of mentality, which seems not to be the case at all anymore. Yeah. <laughs> unless it's like, know, unless it's like, that some big name author like jk rowling or whatever right. how do you answer that or i was just like well that's not really how books sell anymore like they're, yeah. they're they're those things are important we try and do what we can and we do send out the books and we can show them who we sent them to yeah. and attempt to get reviews but that most of it is like chatter and like yeah. um getting people like seeing the book or like someone emailed me yesterday being like, oh, I've been seeing this book of yours everywhere. And they're like, hopefully you'll review this book of ours. And what's funny is I already did review their book. Yeah, um, and, but like, they didn't see my review, but they've seen mentions of our book, which isn't even out yet. So it's yeah. like, <laughs> it's like perceptual based in that yeah. I try and convince, try and when I talk to my trying to convince them that of like, yeah, the world isn't what it was. Yeah. I know that it is that in like Spain and in, in yeah. the Netherlands and in, in other France and places of the world where they do have these launch parties and big, you know, the, the papers are going to review the book on the day it comes out right. and everything's going to be like discussed and like intellectualized, but we don't, yeah. we've gone so far away from that now. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, it's very rare that we get, you know, major reviews for any of, for any of the books. Yeah. Same thing you did for this though, for anniversaries, right? Anniversary, anniversary, we put a lot of effort into it. I mean, as we were saying with the two years of, you know, we basically spent two years marketing that book. That's wild. Um, Poof. and put a lot of, put a lot of pressure, you know, we had talked about it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I knew it was coming forever. Yeah. I mean, we, we spent two years trying to tell people about do you, it. Do you ever try and get Michael Orthop around your payroll so that he can just like promote it constantly? It's like his to. favorite I, book I, ever. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. Come on. I think <laughs> I haven't looked recently, but last time I looked, there were still more Dolky reviews than NYRB reviews. And and complete review. I think last time I looked, it may have been a year ago. Now. Ooh, this is um, that's like a that's something a to lot. keep an eye on. A lot of <laughs> yeah, I mean they're probably they're going you know back in. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've been, yeah been around longer, longer, yeah. more books for that are eligible. Did you really about the Anna Schmidt book? Speaking of really really long German books, the, what about it? Did people buy it? It's no longer in print. So they supposedly sold out their print run, but what do you think? I but I believe that they stated what their print run was, and do you know what they said their print run was? Uh, yeah. Thousand copies. That's it. And I believe they sold out of those thousand copies. But that <laughs> financially, without the without a foundation support, doesn't make any sense as like a yeah the viability because that thing was huge and expensive and like yeah. even if you sold it for a hundred bucks, it, like it doesn't seem to add up right. And so I think yeah. the, the foundation helped them a lot, but it's crazy that you could do that project and like make a, a book that's like a collector's item of sorts. That's like right. whatever, whatever it was, 13 pounds or 90 pounds or whatever <laughs> like yeah. weighed. Right. Um, and then it's just gone. How many pages was it? It was like, it's like 1400 pages, but they're big. It was oversized. And I think it weighed yeah. three and a half pounds, the book itself. I think anniversaries weighs five. Does it really? Yes. I only carry around the one volume and I'm like. In the box. In the box. In the box. Is, yeah. Five pounds. Wow. You guys are. Yeah. So like, take that, Delkey. You're going to have a heavy, problems, heavy book. One of the problems of doing these kind of books, and this I think is a real shame, I guess, because I, I, the book is great. I, I've read three quarters of it and I love it. Yeah. Um, that a lot of the attention becomes about the size. That's Sorry, true. Like that. It is like one of those things that like, once it's that big, it's hard not to have to mention that it's that big yeah. and that, it, that yeah. and that's a part of it. But, um, but I do, I agree. Is there any, I know that you're going to have to go in a second, but I have, I have two last questions for you, unless Anthony yeah. has one. One, how would you convince someone in like two statements to read this book, even though it is big? And then, Two, who wins the Champions League? <laughs> um, I guess, despite the size <laughs> of the book, it moves very quickly. And I find Gesina and Marie very charming 
and lovable and it's about people and it's you know it's about big historical you know movements and moments and and the media and you know poverty in new york city in 68 and all this but it really it's about you know a single mom and her daughter you know together living in the city and kind of making a life together um so it's very readable and fun yeah. enjoyable um champion i think tottenham's gonna win wow <laughs> Bold <laughs> statement. Uh, I think Tottenham's going to win. Anthony, who's going to win the Champions League? Uh, it's not going to be Liverpool. That's really all that matters. Do they play today? Are they play now? No, no they play week. next Wednesday. Next week. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'll pick Barcelona just to be okay. obvious. Fine. And nothing else. Yeah. I, I stick with Tottenham. Oh, I think I'm even wearing a Tottenham shirt. I guess are you this is not... <laughs> oh. Oh my God! You are nice. Nice. <laughs> You have seen who else is left? PSG, Atletico Madrid. I'd I'd pull for Atletico Madrid. Hey, we can beat Borussia Dortmund. We can beat anybody. Except <laughs> <laughs> so Ajax, who kicked the shit out of Real Madrid yesterday. Yeah. That was the greatest thing. Oh my god. <laughs> so as so with the soccer talk, I think that's probably a good place to end. But thank you for, oh. but thank you for coming on and talking about this. And uh, oh, and we'll keep keep writing about you guys all month. Excellent. Um, and yeah, talk to Edwin. I will. He's supposed to say he's going to, he says he's back this weekend. We're going to talk. Yeah, so. exactly. yeah. cool. Okay. Cool. Right. Love. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon.